It's Tuesday, February 8th, 2022, and you're listening to episode 590 of Fear the Boot, a show about tabletop role-playing games and a little bit more. Running time for this episode is 34 minutes. Welcome to Fear the Boot. My name is Dan. This is Wayne. I'm Brodor. All right, let's lead off with a big and positive announcement. Fear the Con 2022, which we've been giving you guys the dates for so you can hold the place, get the time off, get your airfare or drives worked out or whatever it is you need to do. But now special thanks to Wayne. The Con Planner site is live so you can get out there, create your attendees and start creating and signing up for events. You know, I debated on the name for a while of calling it Fear the Con 2020 Take Two or something like that. But I just went with 2022 because I'm boring. I like Fear the Con 2022, the new variant. (laughs) (laughs) So if you want to get out there, which I know you do, and start getting on that, just fearthecon.com. And we'll put it in the show notes, but it's that simple. Fearthecon.com and start getting stuff set up. If you were on the Kickstarter for it and had an event level reward, be sure to be checking your messages on Kickstarter because we are reaching out to you guys. Wayne has been sending out messages to start getting everyone lined up for the games and slots they're going to be in. And we will make sure that you guys get attached where you're supposed to be so you've got entry into the right event if any of the previous backer levels are not able to be fulfilled we will find some equivalency and we will make it good yes we will do our best and other than that we look forward to seeing as many of you as can possibly make it come this june june 16th 17th and 18th so there was something that we were talking about I think we were talking about we were playing the AP, but we also got to talking about it amongst ourselves off mic, which is Monday morning quarterbacking your own games. And where it came up was, Brodor, you have a habit of recording the games that you run and then playing them back at, I'll assume, faster speed or something at a compressed speed and taking some notes and reviewing how you did as a GM. Now, obviously, what you're doing now running a game on the AP makes it easier because we're already recording it. But you do this with your own regular home games, right? I do. I have a simple, inexpensive audio recorder, just a digital recorder. And it's quality enough that I can turn it on, put the hold on so if it gets knocked over, it won't stop recording or anything. I can put it in front of my GM screen. And it will get everyone at the table well enough that I can go back and take notes from the game, but also make notes about what I did well, what I didn't do well, what I want to try to adapt or focus on, improve, etc. I'm thinking about getting another one because mine is over 10 years old and the sound quality currently is nothing like it was when I first got it. I think the whole thing's ready to give out, but... If I listen to myself, GM, I don't know that I would want to keep running games because I am my own worst critic and I would probably like I would listen to it and I would just find everything that I think I did wrong. And you do. It's very, very challenging to not fall into the trap of self-loathing. And, and that's been my trap for 47 years. But once you get past that, I find it very, very helpful. But the thing that helped me get past it, frankly, was doing audio editing of myself doing the interview podcast, right? So I can't imagine you've done so much editing of yourself over the last couple of years doing your game notes. I would just imagine that you would be able to handle it a lot better than you're giving yourself credit for. I don't know, because when I look at running a game, that's more of a, a performance thing than just a quick conversation. I guess when I really think about it, it kind of is the same thing, and you're probably right, but I just think of it as being bigger. Yeah, I definitely do think of it as different because I suppose you would get over some of the real simple hurdles like getting used to the sound of your own voice. If you're not used to listening to yourself recorded, listening to yourself, whether it's a podcast or game session, 
you still are going to get past the shock of hearing your own voice and not nitpicking the fact that it doesn't sound like what you hear in your own head. But there is structurally a difference to it for me. With the podcast, there's a definite flow to the way it works. I'm trying to think how to explain this because it's I've done it so long, it's now more intuitive than it is contemplated. But I've got the same problem. It's like I know what I'm thinking and yeah, I can't put it to yeah, words why it's different. It's like there's a structure to it that I'm coming to it with a sort of an essayist mind that I'm going to have a basic point, some supporting evidences, respond to some anticipated counter arguments, and then restate it as a conclusion. I don't do voices on a podcast. Yeah, we don't do voices. We're also not reacting to each other in really the same way, because I know that Wayne or you or you or anyone could bring some counterpoint to me that I didn't expect, but it's still going to be roughly within a, a certain band of expected things you're going to say about a topic. Whereas role playing is so much more extemporaneous. It is so much more freewheeling. It is so much more chaotic. You're responding to things that may be completely out of left field. You, of course, have the added element of the dice change things. And you're trying to control a world or portray a world, which to me is a whole lot more complicated than, say, doing this, explaining a point and trying to defend or structure a single point to get across to an audience. And I'm not going to go back and listen to this episode to critique myself as an amateur broadcaster. But I am going to go back and listen to my game as an amateur game master for areas where I think I can and should improve, right? So we can do recuts here and edits and everything's great. With your role-playing game, it's all live, right? So sometimes you have moments of brilliance and there's moments of magic that you can't recreate that you may not even do great justice in remembering. Having that recording and going back I find very helpful in that aspect as well. To go back and go, that was a great moment. Why was it a great moment? Let me listen to it again. Okay, that description was really cool or how I grabbed the table was really cool or where I stammered here was unnecessary. And obviously one of the things that I find that I do is I stammer to hold space while I'm thinking about what I'm going to say next, as opposed to pausing and trying to better enunciate, I will pick a word like the, the, uh, 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 anyway, you know, I do stuff like that. So I found out that was something that I do just in a game I was running yesterday. So my online D and D game, somebody was uh, afraid that my mic had cut out. And I realized that when I'm trying to figure out what an NPC would say, So I'm interacting in the moment and I know what the NPC is going to say, but I have to put it through the voice of the NPC. So the NPC is going to give them piece of information A, but how would this NPC word it? Sometimes I have that pause where in my head I'm rewording what I would have just said as myself into NPC's voice. And I never realized I had that pause. I would totally realize that if I'm listening to myself, because pauses are something I look for when I'm editing. Well, yeah, ums, uhs, stutters, all that kind of stuff, they really serve one purpose for two reasons. The one purpose is to hold the mic. It's to signal to someone else that you are still talking, your thought is not done being expressed. And that happens for one or two reasons, either because you need time to formulate what you're going to say. So you know you're putting a thought together and you verbally tread water by stuttering a little bit or using these little verbal tics. Or the other thing is when you're just speaking extemporaneously and you start to say the wrong word or form the wrong sound, it's a way of resetting your vocal position. So it's a way of basically resetting your speech and getting yourself back to a neutral position to start speaking again. 
on a podcast, as you said, we have the advantage of we can cut all of that out and the whole thing can sound a lot more natural in the final product. But in a role-playing game, especially where I'm trying to take many mindsets, many voices, and I'm doing it all without editing, without multiple cuts, this is a live performance, I don't have that luxury. And so I'm sure I stutter and say a lot of things that would really hurt me. They hurt my soul as someone that has to edit and produce audio. So can I be a more effective game master and a better communicator by listening to those tapes and trying to still hold your attention, be a strong storyteller and not stammer to the degree that I do to not repeat words. Like for example, I said pustulant the other day during the role playing (laughs) game, referring to this woman's gums to Clarissa, the pins gums. And I was like, dude, why did you say that? word you use postulant more than once in the previous session when you were talking about the uh when you were talking about the syphilitic ulcers and everything it's like grabbing a fucking book from clive barker open a random page and the likelihood that you're going to find the word din is very high but I, I want to communicate and be creative and have a strong vocabulary and not repeat words like pustulant. Is there a different word I could have used to describe her thumbs, right? That's the kind of thing. And I know it sounds nitpicky, but I want to be able to communicate with a flow and be concise and not waste words. Okay. And I will concede that to bust out a Venn diagram, which I haven't done in a while, If you were to create one circle that represents all the aspects of good public speaking and then take another circle that represents all the aspects of good storytelling, there's going to be a lot of overlap. Now, I don't think it's going to be 100 percent overlap. I agree completely. But I would say, okay, there's going to be at least a 33 percent, 50 percent, 66 percent, you know, something in that neighborhood overlap of skills. Speaking clearly, using diversity in your vocabulary without becoming a thesaurus. Because sometimes word choice becomes so unusual, it's obvious. Nothing makes me want to put down a fantasy book faster than when they get tired of using the verb drink or sip or whatever and switch to quaff. Nobody says quaff. <laughs> I'm glad you found it in the thesaurus. Don't use it. <laughs> yeah, unless I'm talking about my hair, my coiffe. Yeah. <laughs> Well, wouldn't that be coif? Yeah, that's what I said, coif. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one other thing I think it would be really helpful for if I had these type of recordings is preparing for the next session. Because as things are going on during a session, you don't have the context of what's going to happen next in the session and at the end. But when you're re-listening to it, you'll go through a moment where you're an NPC talking to a player, but you know how the session's going to end now. And you know what's going to happen next. That might be more inspiring. Oh, this NPC said this. I know this is going to happen. I can foreshadow something else for the next session. I know I'm, I'm a bit scattered because there are a variety, just different facets of benefit that I found to doing this. But one of them is every game master has that NPC that the player characters gravitated toward for some reason. And... This allows me the opportunity to go back and listen to me perform as that NPC. What is it that worked? Why did the players gravitate toward that NPC? What was it that was entertaining or exciting or interesting or compelling about that person? And what can I learn from that? You know, what lesson can I take? I draw from that. I have a strong belief that we'll talk about this on another episode. A GM makes a NPC good. The players make the NPC great. I believe that pretty strongly based on just what are the NPCs that stick around. It's the ones that the players care about and force you to develop better. Your idea of listening back on these NPCs, though, that would be huge for me right now because in my D&D game, I have these NPCs in the town, the village that they've grown to know and like and love. And we just did an adventure to the big capital. They haven't been in their small town for three sessions now. 
I got to remember the voice of each of those NPCs that they're going to want to see now that they're back. And if you're regularly listening to your recording and you're combining that with your one note or whatever organization system you have, you can go back and be like, okay, session one, this NPC appeared and here's an important character trait about that NPC. It allows me to... I don't want to say the development of that NPC's character, right? Or their story arc, because I'm not that good a writer or a game master. But as things change or there are elements of their voice that I want to make sure that I remember in the future, it helps me to remember, oh, let me go back and on Clarissa the Pin's note card in my one note, let me make sure that I put this aspect on her character so I remember to play that in the future. Yeah, and we're using the term voice, but at least for me, I mean voice in the broader sense, not the actual way that the yeah, sounds the literary uh, yeah, term no, voice. I'm sorry, yeah, no, I, yeah. I, I was tracking, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the literary term voice. So we don't just mean an affectation. Oh, yes, I'm, I'm Clarissa yeah. the Pin. I've come here with my bling pin to put into <laughs> yeah. your little dirt cutter. Yeah. Well, you actually use both forms of voice yeah. there. So yeah. you use voice in terms of altering your sound. Right. But you also used voice in terms of changing your perspective, your vocabulary, your approach to communication, changing the way that you communicate something. Look, if you're reading text on a page, if the author is good, the characters all have voice. Right. Yet they don't sound like anything. You're just reading text on a page. You may imagine them to sound like something. Yeah, the word choices you use go a long way to defining the character. And that's something that's hard for me to remember across three or four sessions if I haven't seen that NPC in a while. But I want to be consistent. That's a huge thing for me as a GM is consistency because it's a huge thing for me as a player. Because it's important to me as a player, I make it important to me as a GM. So I want to circle back, though, to the point we started on, which is I understand that hearing your own actual voice, the sound of your voice is awesome, is jarring, but you get desensitized to it. My voice is like my jaw, Dan. It's beautiful. But how do you get past the point of just beating yourself down? Because, look, everyone sitting at this table is depressive and self-abusing to one level Mm -hmm. or another. And a lot of people that are involved in the hobby of gaming are depressive and self-abusing to one degree or another. I guarantee you there's at least one thing that each of us has said on this recording that we would say differently that we've thought about after we said it. Yeah, exactly. Something that we have been embarrassed by or whatever. And I will have the advantage of being able to remove those things. (laughs) And that. But how, in listening to a role-playing game, how do you get past the hurdle of actually critiquing or even praising yourself, God forbid, as opposed to just feeling depressed about what you heard. I had a much more difficult time editing myself, speaking to another human being in casual conversation than I did listening to my game. Now, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that I'm listening to the game at a different speed. I'm able to focus on areas that I want to focus on. And that I'm not actually doing editing work. So I'm not cringing every time I hear myself stammer over a word or repeat a word or just being a a brodeur repeat myself in general. It didn't impact me to the same degree as actually editing my speech for public consumption. Why? I don't know. I really don't have an answer to that question. Listening to myself talk to people in a game, I found easier than listening to me do an interview. Do you think, I'm just trying to grasp at straws here, trying to unpack the psychology of this, that maybe part of it is when we do a podcast, we are putting out content to an audience that is not also putting themselves on the line. Whereas in a role-playing game, everyone is making themselves equally vulnerable. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you think I suck, I mean, I, I want to go back <laughs> and listen to other people at my table who also suck and moments that they suck yeah. and that they don't handle it well. Those moments are there, but that's not what I'm focusing on. I'm trying to focus on. But on some level, is that, and I'm just guessing here, is that what makes it easier? Yes. 
You know yeah. something else that yeah, might make I know. You... I, I hadn't thought about it. Sorry, Wayne, to cut you off. I hadn't considered it, but absolutely. Because there are other people there not necessarily being at their tier one best every moment also. Yeah. Yeah, it does make it easier. So I think something else, tying on what you just said, though, Dan, when you're listening to something to edit it, you're listening to something that you're going to release that you know other people are going to listen to. If you're listening to yourself doing a role-playing game, that's not going to be released out to anyone. You're listening to it with a critical ear because you're looking to improve yourself, not a critical ear because you're creating a product. Yeah, I would think that would be another difference. Is If I put out a podcast and I go back to prep it for release, we're listening for the things we did wrong. Mm. That is specifically why I'm listening to it. If I thought there was nothing wrong to it, we wouldn't be editing it. And so we are looking for something that is wrong to remove. We're focusing on those things. And similarly, in a lot of public speaking, where most people hit up against this, is going to be, let's say, places like school, where you've got a teacher or professor sitting there marking you down for every little thing that they don't like. They're not going to it the way they would a movie or a concert or a play where there might be one part of it that sucks, but it's the gestalt. It's the sum of the experience that you walk away with saying this was a good performance, even though this one part wasn't as good as this other part. You don't mark it down the same way. You take it as a whole, I guess. Yeah, I I had one encounter, right? I don't go back off and be like, man, I really kicked ass there. That was great. But I had one encounter with a hag and, and I won't bore you with the gaming story. But what I will say is, is that this hag, I, I hadn't really given her a voice or had a physical description of her until that moment. I need to think about a game and have an idea where the game's going. I don't do great with chaos fly by the seat of my pants. It's just not my thing. But I did create this night hag basically out of whole cloth. Not her name. She, I had her name and her sister's name and why their names were their names and why the sisters hated each other and how they were going to pit the PCs against one another and blah, blah. But when I described her physically, it just came to me. And my players were intrigued and repulsed, so I just kept going. And so this creature was far more grotesque and asymmetric and malformed by the end of the description. But the PCs at that point had become so enthralled with the juxtaposition of her hideous nature and her eloquent, polite behavior and her diction that I was like, okay, I did something right there. What was it that I provided to the players that they were enthralled in that moment? So it let me go back and listen to her description, but also take some really solid notes so that if that NPC reoccurs in the game, I will do her justice in the future. I think one other thing it would do for me, just having done editing of my own voice, I can tell when I'm enjoying what I'm talking about mm. versus when I am pushing through. And it is always better content, whether the content is the game I'm running or something I'm recording, if I'm enjoying it. If I am anxious and out there, then it's going to show in whatever performance I'm doing. So that's something listening to it. I would look for those moments where I'm enjoying myself and ask the question, what did I enjoy about that? You know what? That's my hang up with Bl the Blades in the Dark game. I'm having difficulty finding my joy in it as a game master. And I think that because I have difficulty understanding the system and, and grokking that, you're right. Because even if a scene is of limited significance, if I'm enjoying it and I'm having a good time and I'm getting good feedback and energy from the players, then yeah, that's the stuff I want to I, I wanna focus on. I said, I just came to that realization when I was recording a Game Notes today. I had a really good session yesterday, and I started thinking about why was it a good session. My best sessions are always when I'm feeling my most comfortable, when I'm not overly anxious about what I'm doing, or I haven't overwhelmed myself with notes. When I'm enjoying it, 
my players enjoy it more as well. And I can't bring my A game if I'm not having fun. But I don't always know what makes me have fun. Yeah, Same. And I think that's one of the reasons, and I didn't talk about this very much. I didn't talk about it at all during the game notes that I submitted to you. But my midnight game stopped being fun. It really did. And that, I think, probably... That happened long before I realized that the game needed to be finished, that it just was no longer enjoyable. You know, something else, and this is really emotionally and socially unhealthy, I'm just being honest, something that I think would help me is a large part of my enjoyment and energy of a game comes from the shared energy of the environment. So if I'm having a down-tempo game, a lot of times that's as much the fault of the players as it is me as the game master. Whereas conversely, if I screw up a public speech or I screw up this podcast, it's not the fault of the audience. I sucked. But if I'm listening to a game, I can be like, you know, this was on me. But over here, the game gets really slow and boring because these people aren't participating and now I can blame shift <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> and feel better about myself. And that's, I'm not saying it's mature, but well, it may also be true. Obviously, it may be true. Here's where I get petty is I write down the time where an argument started and I knew I was right. I know I'm right. And I know here at minute at one hour, 35 minutes and so many seconds that this argument occurred. And then I'll go back and I'll be like, mother. Or I knew I was right. I knew I was right the whole goddamn time. <laughs> and not going back and being like, you, you sons of bitches. You know, I have a hard time not being that yeah. guy. Nothing's quite as unproductive, yeah. but also as cathartic <laughs> as a blame storming session. <laughs> <laughs> blame storming. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. But yeah, for, for me, the, the highlights are great notes, really delving into the NPCs and, and, and what works there. But also I really appreciate the opportunity to go back and listen to myself speak and listen to myself, try to manage the table. Yeah. Well, and if you are interested in getting better, we oftentimes are not aware of what we do right in the course of making this show. I have learned a lot about my verbal tics about the fact that if I'm not very careful in the way I pace and enunciate, which is why I speak the way I do, I tend to talk very quickly. There's certain phrases that I will use too frequently. Uh, one of the things that I'm trying to sort out now is I lapse in and out of ending sentences on an uptone instead of making them sound more declarative. And so that's something I'm trying to sort out right now. This is the same reason that people that play sports watch tapes of themselves play is they don't realize that, OK, you're not doing real good zone coverage right here because you're focused on this. Or when you run and you're starting to kind of go like this, your one foot goes a little in front of the other, which is why you're tripping yourself up. So here's some things you can do with the coach, some exercises to try and get that problem worked out. And I have no doubt that I have issues as a game master i don't know i have because i haven't listened to myself game master because even with the actual plays i release them but outside of a very very small number of things they're not reviewed or edited i mean if we, one of us says something that is just so far over the top that it's like no this is going to sink the show yeah it's usually <laughs> wayne then yeah <laughs> usually it's wayne but I'll go back and I'll note the time on that. There have been a couple phrases or words that I've dropped because like, yeah, that was a bridge too far. Yeah, we joke about the whiteboard, but there's a reason the whiteboard exists. Yeah, 99% of that, though, is unreviewed content. I am mentally paying attention as we're doing it. And I will note, OK, around this time, something was said that's got to go. But even that's very rare. And I have never once listened front to back to an entire episode of the AP. It's like, you know, I was there for it. I have the episodes I weren't there for. Yeah, well, and I guess that's the difference is since we record them at my place, 
I mean, maybe there was one or two I missed when we were doing them online, but I don't think so. I think I've been there for 100% of the games. I think there was one. I think I missed one. One episode of the Blades in the Dark game that was remote that you didn't make it yeah. to. Out of the entire time we've been doing yeah, the three AP. and a half years or whatever doing this, I missed one game. Yeah, Your notes thing's a big one, Brodar, because I used to be really note heavy. And I don't mean like prep notes. I mean note heavy while I'm doing things. And I found the longer that I game, the more I get into the game itself and forget to take notes. I take really in-depth notes for the first five minutes, and then I won't have anything again until, like, the end. And it's frustrating because I like to reference those notes, but I want to enjoy the game, whether I'm running it or playing in it. And for some reason that just over time... I can't do both at the same time. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. I, I used to be able to do both, or maybe I thought I was doing both, but I wasn't getting into them as much because I was still new to role-playing games. But I can't do it now. It's one or the other. Another thing that I think is important and helpful to me for recording my games is, and this is something that I learned from you know my mentor, Dave Wallace, is... If you had to do it over again, what would you do differently? And we talked about that at the beginning. You alluded to it at the beginning of this episode. I can go back and I can say, wow, that encounter was really, really good. But there was a moment there where if I did an encounter like that again, I would give this another beat or I would have the NPC react just a little bit differently in that fashion. And I know that, People don't want to do it, but with gaming, to me, I, I always want to do it like stand-up comedy. I, I want to do the set again and again and again. I want to run the perfect session, right? Like, I just want to keep running the same one shot multiple times in different venues for different audiences and just perfect that game. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, that's not a realistic goal. I mean, it could be. But what's more realistic is I'm going to listen to every game that I run and I'm going to try to be better. And sometimes I'm going to succeed and sometimes I'm not. Yeah, that's something I don't know why more people don't do. You go through all the trouble of coming up with a con game, doing all the prep, and then you run it at a con and then you just never think about it never again. Never run it again. You've yeah. already got that content. You could run that at a different Fuck, con. Are you kidding? Or another year or multiple slots multiple in the same slots, con. Same con. I, yeah. I, already, I, enjoy I already have that. those maps. I already have those miniatures. And the thing is, is that each time you can then refine it, right? Yeah. The I first can... con game I ever ran at a con, I ran twice at that con. And I got to see how two completely different groups approached the exact same setup. And that was so entertaining. But I never think about rerunning any of that. See, I want to run the game on Thursday at Gen Con, Friday at Gen Con, and then Friday at Origins, and Saturday at Origins, and then Saturday at Game Hole Con, and Sunday at Game... You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I just want to keep doing that game and refine yeah. that one act. And I know there are people that do that, right. but most people don't. You go to all the trouble to create it and then just push that content aside and never think about it. Or if you suddenly have a opportunity to run a one shot, you never think, I've already got all the paperwork for this. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think that's where we're going to wrap this one up. Once again, don't forget to go to fearthecon.com. We will put it in the show notes. Easy one to remember. But just in case, uh, we'll put it in the show notes so you can find your way to it. And we hope to see you guys all there. And that aside, have a great week and great games, and we will catch you next time. This has been a production of Fear the Boot, copyright 2022. Listeners are free to use this episode in a non-commercial endeavor, so long as credit is provided to feartheboot.com. You can find previous episodes and other resources at feartheboot.com. If you wish to support this show and its related endeavors, you can do so at patreon.com slash feartheboot.